Mary Oliver was a private person. She rarely gave interviews, preferring, as she said, to let her work speak for her. I'm going to honor that and refrain from offering a bunch of facts about her amazing life. Instead, I'll let her poetry be the legacy she wanted you to hear and remember her by. I'll interweave it with some of my own thoughts about mortality, which is much on my mind the last few years, and especially this year as the pandemic took my aunt and so many others. For clarity and to avoid saying quote and end quote repeatedly, I'm just going to raise my hand like this when I'm speaking Mary Oliver's words. And to begin, I want to share an excerpt from Mary's poem, To Live in This World. The excerpt is number 696 in our gray hymnals, but for now, just, just listen. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. To let it go. That's not an easy task. It's not an easy ask either. My mother's father was born in 1894. Grandpa Steggy was the oldest of seven children. So when his parents could no longer afford a coachman, care of the family's horses fell to him at the age of six in the year 1900. You know, horses were transportation then, not recreation. Even living in New York City, he wouldn't see his first automobile until he was in his 20s. In my 20s, when Grandpa was 98 years old, I sat on his bed in a small town hospital in eastern Ohio. My mom had taken a break from sitting with him to play with my kids in the hospital's grassy courtyard. Grandpa had been asleep for several days, and we figured it wouldn't be long. So I held his hand, a hand that just the week before had been hoeing in my mom's garden. Back then, straightening up, he had cursed his arthritis yet again, saying, as always, Johnny, don't ever get old. I didn't say anything because after he had mumbled his way through all the names of his kids and my siblings before finally lighting on Johnny, I wasn't about to correct him with the more recent JD, which I've now been for, for decades. So I sat on the side of the bed, just looking at this quiet old man. And I don't know if I said it aloud or just in my head, but I said, you can go whenever you're ready, Grandpa. As though in response, the pauses between his breaths got longer and longer until the pauses were far longer than the breaths. And when in, within a few minutes, that last one more breath never came. It was peaceful. At his memorial service, I never cried. I cry in Disney movies, graduations, thoughtful conversations, you name it. But not at Grandpa's service. I thought there must be something wrong with me. It took me years to realize that maybe those last quiet moments with him had been a bigger gift than I had realized, offering a chance at a different relationship with death. In her poem, The Uses of Sorrow, Mary Oliver writes, Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this, too, was a gift. A box full of darkness. Well, not all deaths are beautiful or peaceful. A former student of mine, the most brilliant I had ever worked with, chose my alma mater for engineering school. <laughs> I was so proud. Near the end of his freshman year, he turned his vast intelligence toward engineering, an elegant method for suffocating himself on the first day of summer break. It worked flawlessly. His body was discovered several days later. Over 25 years later, I'm still angry and confused. A year and a half after losing his only parent, another student's car left a rural road late at night and ran into a large boulder. Nobody saw it happen, but the debris left at the scene made it clear that any suffering was brief. For him, at least, but not for his little brother and sister, now alone in the world. I could go on and on. You probably can, too. 
my spouse's young cousin who didn't wake up one day, mentors and friends gone too soon, dear friends cut down by cancer, ALS, dementia, addiction, heart attacks, and more recently, coronavirus disease. The day before Mary Oliver died in January of 2019, another former student of mine died suddenly. I'd seen him just five days earlier at the Pennsylvania Farm Show. He'd been radiant with the enthusiasm of new prospects, new projects he was working on. Let it go? Let it go, she says? Death is a thief. It steals away those we love with little warning, no right of return, no due process, no redress of grievances. Who wants to be friends with a thief, especially one so capricious and disloyal, one who rips our hearts out time after time after time? I do. The Hebrew book of Genesis says, from dust were ye made and dust ye shall be. And by now, you know it's literally true. We are made from the dust of dying stars. Most of the atoms that make up the stuff in this room, including our bodies, were created in the blast furnace of exploding supernova stars about 9 billion years ago. Before the explosion, only light elements like hydrogen and helium. After the explosion, a dead star and the surrounding space filled with precious heavy dust that gravity slowly collected into all this. So tell me, on the day that star died, was death a thief or a midwife? This idea that joy and creativity, that the joy and creativity of life springs up from the soil of death was a pretty common thread in Mary's poetry. In The Kingfisher, she writes, I think this is the prettiest world, so long as you don't mind a little dying. Carl Sagan once said, the secrets of evolution are time and death. There was a day in the late Cretaceous period, a truly dark day, it was probably a Monday, when death rode in here on a large asteroid. That was a hellish day to be a dinosaur. It wasn't exactly a good day for anyone on the planet, but for our mammalian ancestors, it turned out to be Independence Day, a birthday, Christmas and New Year's Eve, all in one, a huge gift, beautifully gift wrapped in the smell of settling dust and rotting meat. None of us would be here this morning. The incredible creative processes of the tertiary period would never have happened if the dinosaurs hadn't made way for us by dying. So on that day, was death a thief or a midwife? This too was a gift. While he was alive, my mother's father worked in his generation's equivalent of Silicon Valley, but in New Jersey. He worked on electricity, motors, and generators, New, at the time, high-tech replacements for whale oil and horses and manpower. My grandpa installed the first high-pressure steam turbines at Sing, Sing Sing Prison, turbines which powered the now infamous electric chair. He later served as chief engineer on the dredge that built Tangier Island in Chesapeake Bay, it's still there. Rough work with rough men and rough conditions. My grandfather had a different rude name for every ethnicity in Europe. He had only one rude name for all the ethnicities of Africa and one more for those of Asia. My grandpa had really clear categories for people, categories constructed out of ethnic and racial stereotypes, a worldview that segmented his view of everyone he met. He wasn't overtly hateful, he just believed the stereotypes. And the culture in which he grew and lived supported that. Confirmation bias and rough conditions made it obvious, as in, that's just the way it is. In spite of all that, I think my grandfather's life is worth honoring. I know that the same day his second child was born, 
he was fired from his job at a silk dyeing company because he had reported them for dumping many tons of toxic chemicals into the Passaic River. He just shrugged and took a job as chief engineer at St. Joseph's Hospital, although he also had plenty of rude names for Catholics. <laughs> He was 50 when that happened, and he worked at St. Joseph's for the next 25 years, overseeing the construction of facilities that more than doubled the hospital's physical plant, helping save and improve countless lives in the process. As well as I loved him and still do, as glad as I am that we have pictures of him holding my young children, I'm also glad he wasn't around for their formative years, passing on stereotypes and prejudices. So was my grandfather stolen from me or was his passing a gift given by him to his great grandchildren and the hope they represented even to him for a better, kinder, more just future? I was talking about that with my daughter who's now an ordained UU minister and she goes, yeah, dad, just imagine if pre-Civil War plantation owners were still around serving in the Senate. We joked about how we have that. <laughs> but of course, things are better. And it's partly because dinosaurs of all kinds have their day and then die. Well, I'm a dinosaur too. This is my day. And this day of mine is going to end. Maybe this afternoon maybe 50 years from now, but it will end. I can hear evolution's call for my death already in my struggle to get the pronouns right for my transitioning niece, nephew. I see it in my indignant arguments against veganism and the implicit bias of my entire generation when it comes to race and gender. It shows up in driving when I could bike using the dryer when we have a clothesline right there. My death, too, will be a gift. I want to read more of that same Mary Oliver poem, Kingfisher, because I deliberately took that line out of context a few minutes ago. Listen to what she says. The kingfisher rises out of the black wave like a blue flower. In his beak, he carries a silver leaf. I think this is the prettiest world. So long as you don't mind a little dying, how could there be a day in your whole life that doesn't have its splash of happiness? There are more fish than there are leaves on a thousand trees. And anyway, the kingfisher wasn't born to think about it or anything else. When the wave snaps shut over his blue head, the water remains water. Hunger is the only story he has ever heard in his life that he could believe. I don't say he's right. Neither do I say he's wrong. Religiously, he swallows the silver leaf with its broken red river. And with a rough and easy cry, I couldn't rise out of my thoughtful body if my life depended on it, he swings back over the bright sea to do the same thing, to do it as I long to do something, anything, perfectly. Whether you are a kingfisher or a person, to live is to eat, and to eat is to kill. You know, we can argue about the relative harm of killing plants or killing animals, but either way, death is right there in every mouthful. From the Big Bang right through the next election cycle and beyond, death and loss are inextricably linked to birth and creation. Yes, death is a thief, but it's also a midwife. It takes and gives with the same hands. My life is a gift, a gift only made possible by the deaths of stars, of dinosaurs, of deep mammalian ancestors, grandparents, and the dead animals and plants I ate for breakfast this morning. It's a gift 
that I will pay forward by getting my spoiled 20th century butt out of the way of 22nd century progress, whether I like it or not. But I don't want to die. I don't want to not exist. I want to be part of something permanent. I want to participate. I want some part of me to live on. And it does. A friend who loves my seven candles work <clears throat> had just lost her grandfather, who she calls Papa. And she asked me to write something hopeful about the afterlife. I wrote, and here I'm quoting myself, <clears throat> remember our bodies are not things, we are flows. What was an apple yesterday is now me. And what was me yesterday is now Chesapeake Bay. Some of what was me when I just said that has now flown out to become wind and weather, having been replaced by some millions of atoms that last week were your papa. Another breath, another few million atoms that were once your papa and you and the girl down the street and everyone else who ever lived on the earth. You and me, in and out, day after day, co-mingling together on an interwoven planet of living flow. And before they were your papa, those atoms were someone, something else, giant redwoods, gentle giraffes, oceans, mountains, lava. Your papa came from everything, was part of everything, and is everything still. Atoms and energy that once flowed through your papa will go on to adventure as opalescent seashells, newborn infants that smell like God herself, starlight on the endless journey between galaxies, and the lightest, sweetest cornbread you ever tasted. Here's how Mary Oliver put it in her poem, Sleeping in the Forest. I thought the earth remembered me. She took me back so tenderly, arranging her dark skirts, her pockets full of lichens and seeds. I slept as never before, a stone on the riverbed, nothing between me and the white fire of the stars, but my thoughts. And they floated light as moths among the branches of the perfect trees. All night, I heard the small kingdoms breathing around me, the insects and the birds who do their work in the darkness. All night, I rose and fell as if in water, grappling with a luminous doom. By morning, I had vanished at least a dozen times into something better. You know, our cultural metaphors warn us about death as a hooded figure, stealthily approaching, approaching, coming for us. I'm learning to think about it the other way around. Death is already here. Death is inside every seed, every warm spring day, every birth, inside every pregnant moment, waiting with loving arms for me. I walk towards death inexorably, inevitably. My only choice is whether to walk with my back to it, fearful and closed up, or to turn and embrace death with open arms, saying, welcome, thief. Welcome, friend. I'm ready. I'm ready to share forward what you gave me so that others, new others, may live and breathe and create a better world after me. Yeah, that all sounds nice, and I'm sincere in it. But it doesn't patch up the emptiness left by people I love who were stolen away. The projects Josh enthused about at the farm show will never happen, and his family will miss him at every holiday, every birthday. I still hear my grandfather's voice every time I strip a wire or use his tools. And I wish he could see my children now. When people die, their absence remains and everything is different without them. 
For grieving survivors, the sorrow death brings is as much a part of the landscape as lilies. Mary Oliver's poem, The Lilies Break Open Over the Dark Water, expresses this beautifully. She writes, and there you are on the shore, fitful and thoughtful, trying to attach them to an idea, some news of your own life. But the lilies are slippery and wild. They are devoid of meaning. They are simply doing from the deepest spurs of their being what they are impelled to do every summer. And so, dear sorrow, are you. Death is a disloyal, greedy thief. We can befriend him or not, but you know, you can't unfriend him any more than you can unfriend life. Death and life are that cute elderly couple who still have tickle fights under the covers and make flirty eyes as they walk hand in hand by the lily pond. Together, they do horrible, wonderful things. This too is a gift. The grieving process, whether it be for loved ones or for a favorite poet, or for the losses that come with a global pandemic, grief is just arduous and personal. It just is. Today, as we remember Mary Oliver and contemplate impermanence, let us live knowing that death's gift to us is no less than life itself, given to us at birth and again with every meal, but given by us only once, a gift of renewal to all those who come after. Let us celebrate existence and mourn our losses. Let our rememberings and our sorrows be a gift to ourselves, to one another, and to all those who come after. Amen.